Bay Ridge Church family, we're going to continue focusing on giants. No, not the football giants or the baseball giants or or Goliath or his brothers, uh, but the giants, the giants that keep us from experiencing life, abundant and full life, which Jesus promised his children. You know, of all the places Sharon and I have traveled from the eastern shores of North Carolina and Florida to the majesty of the Rocky Mountains from Colorado up into Canada to the desert southwest to the coast of the Pacific from Mexico up to Washington and the beaches of Hawaii. We find the ocean the most relaxing and fascinating. We find ourselves sitting for hours and, and watching and listening to the breaking waves. We find them so soothing, yet so destructive. As I sit and watch the ocean at high tide, I'm kind of reminded of our emotions, those times when we're up and nothing can bring us down. All problems and obstacles are overpowered by the sheer force of my emotional high. Many people prefer the low tide. You know, the swimming is better. That's when you find your souvenir sea shells. And low tide at times reminds me of also of our emotions when we're down, when we're low. You know, it's at low tide that you start seeing all the junk that you can find in the ocean and then on the beach. Ugliness, barrenness at times. And that can describe somewhat of what happens in our periods of low emotions, periods of depression. Our lives seem bleak, blank, empty, except for the garbage, we feel worthless and unloved, not needed. And we don't have the strength or the power to overcome them or to cover them up any longer. And we would all have to admit that during those periods of depression, we aren't experiencing life to the full as Jesus promised and provided for us. Now, before I go any further with this giant of depression, I'd like us to maybe understand a little bit the difference between sadness and depression. They have some similarities, but they aren't the same. We all have periods of emotional highs and lows, periods of happiness and sadness. So is sadness depression? Well, there really are three differences between sadness and depression, three main differences. First one is that depression lasts much longer than sadness. The second is that depression has a much more intense feeling, feelings that become overwhelming, whether it be those feelings of worthlessness or meaninglessness or just despair or hopelessness. And third, uh, depression interferes with the way in which we live our lives. With sadness, we can just keep going. We keep, you know, plugging on. It's, it's like we're just at the edge of excitement. It's not there, but it's at the edge. We keep plugging away to get there, 
But depression, depression affects our work efficiency. We see our, our efficiency dropping and maybe even to the point of complete withdrawal uh, from work, from family, from friends, from church, or any social kinds of situations. Now, in, in defining depression, I would say that depression is a response. It's a response to whatever is going on or something that is haywire in our lives. It's really a message system. It's telling us that there's something else wrong here and we need to pay attention to it and we need to find out what it is and we need to take care of it. Well, what are some of the causes or reasons of depression? And what is and what as Christians is to be our response? Now, I want you to understand right now, right at, at the beginning here, I'm not talking about manic depression, bipolar things, uh, chemical imbalances, and, and so forth. Um, or even uh, living with and dealing with long-term illnesses or situations like that. Um, it's been said that there are at least somewhere between eight and 10 major causes of depression other than those, those kinds of things. And I'm only going for three today because uh, because of time, but also because these three are specifically mentioned in examples found in Scripture. So maybe we need to pay attention to that. Uh, so three reasons for depression. The first one is, is physical. You know, there can be a physical reason for depression, such as lack of sleep. You know, each of our bodies requires a certain number or a certain amount of rest in order to function at full capacity. And if we go for long periods of time with less than what we really need, our bodies are going to run down, um, less energy. We're going to accomplish less, which can bring on guilt and, and feelings of worthlessness. Uh, another is uh, poor eating habits. Again, our bodies require certain nutrients and they can't really function to full capacity without them. There can be other physical causes like hypoglycemia and the thyroid and, and things like that. Now, one Bible example here, biblical example we have is found in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. And here we find the prophet Elijah uh, facing the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. Asherah. Uh, one of the greatest showdowns of all times. One against 850. And God brings the victory to Elijah. And all of those false prophets were done away with. Well, this totally angers Ahab and Jezebel. And Jezebel sends Elijah a message. And this is what she said. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And she's talking about the prophets that were killed. <laughs> Elijah scared. And, and he took off. You know, it didn't matter that God had just taken care of 850 of these guys. He was scared. And he ran from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. That's 16 miles. And then he went 90 more miles from Jezreel to Beersheba. And then he went another day's journey, maybe about 20 miles, into the wilderness. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, after all of that running and walking, Elijah prays this. 
I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Uh, sounds like some pretty overwhelming feelings. We need to take note of what happens next. Elijah falls asleep. He needs rest. But then after the rest, he's awakened by an angel with food and water sent by God. You know, with all of the, those emotions churning inside of Elijah, with all of his need of security and, and love and hope, what does God give him? First, rest and food and water. The second cause, uh, spiritual. And we could say here unconfessed sin or guilt. Biblical example, David, second king of Israel, whom scripture says was a man after God's own heart. Well, when David was uh, close to 50 years old, he fell into a deep sin in a moment of weakness. And for almost an entire year, he refused to deal with that conviction that comes from God. And during that time, in an attempt to conceal the sin of adultery, you know, he kind of just added sin upon sin, becoming, uh, becoming a liar, a thief, and even a murderer. Now, there are several psalms uh, which David wrote, which tells of God's dealings with him and David's eventual repentance. Among them are Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. Listen to this portion of Psalm 32. This is David. He says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, as God's hand, was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, the weight of, of guilt became so oppressive to David that he sank into despair and depression. And do you know what? This still happens today. People suffering depression because of guilt, the guilt of unconfessed sin or the guilt of active sin in their lives. A third reason, third cause, uh, emotional. And, and often this comes from an obsession with self. Well, we may call it self-concept, self-image, self-esteem. It relates to how I see myself, but even more so how I'm being seen, how I think I'm being seen by others. Whether it be employer or friend or spouse, there's those feelings of being accepted and respected and and feeling that I belong and feeling that I'm needed and feeling successful and feeling like I've accomplished what God wants me to accomplish, feeling that God loves me and accepts me. And when we begin to feel the opposite of these, I'm not, I'm feeling like I'm not being respected. I, I'm feeling like I don't belong. I, I feel like I'm not needed. Our feelings begin uh, to sink and depression can set in. Now in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8, we find the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, visionary, the superman of God, 
And here we find him involved in some self-revelation. Well, this is what he wrote. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Now, we don't know what those hardships were specifically. Paul doesn't elaborate for us, but whatever they were, the circumstances were so bad that they felt they were going to die. Verse 9 says, indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. So here we find Paul, a man so greatly used by God, a man who never backed down, never compromised the gospel, but now he's facing some type of hardship. Could it be that, you know, Paul felt the world was his to conquer, that nothing could stand in his way of fulfilling God's purposes, that he could do all things, that he was relying on himself, but now found that he was unable and failing, and he no longer knew what to do, maybe even second-guessing himself. Maybe Paul's experiencing what we all experience. You know, we all fail. Sooner or later, we fail at something. And maybe our world comes crashing down around us. So if this idea of self and self-concept con is built, if our, our self-concept is built on our performance or success or achievements, what happens when we can no longer perform? What happens when we fail? Do we then view ourselves as something less than what we were or are? Do we build a, a poor self-image of ourselves? Do we bathe ourselves now in self-pity? And if we do that, we find ourselves in the depth of depression. Three reasons that we find in the Bible for depression. Well, what do we do? What do we do? How do we deal with these three causes? Oh, physical. Uh, this is kind of obvious when in a prolonged depression, go get a thorough physical. Uh, tell your doctor what's happening. Now, you know, it, it, it's said and it's true that we're so knit together that often it's impossible to separate the physical, spiritual, and emotional into three things. To check out the physical, then spiritual. Um, ask God to reveal sin in your life, to accept sin as sin and ask the God of all grace and mercy to forgive you, to cleanse you, to remove the stain of guilt from your life, just as David did. Um, this means we humbly come before the Lord in prayer and through his spirit and scripture, allowing him to speak and to convict. Um, don't harden your hearts against him. Don't make excuses. Don't rationalize. Listen to, as David listened to the Nathan, listen to the Nathans whom God brings into your life. Then we have the emotional. You know, in 1 Corinthians 4.8, we read, <clears throat> we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Now the tense of that word despair means 
that despair doesn't have to be an ongoing pattern of behavior. It can read perplexed, but not continually being in a state of despair. See, Paul knows from firsthand experience that there is an answer. There is hope. You know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's a way out that God gives us. And if we go back to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, again, while Paul was in despair, he realized something. And remember verse 9, he states that God had a purpose through his despair that for whatever reason, God allowed this to happen to him. And, and that reason, Paul states, was for Paul not to rely upon himself, but on God. In times of depression, God brings purpose. Maybe it's like Paul to bring us back to a place of full dependence upon him. And Paul also states with assurance, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. It's on him that we have set our hopes. Psalm 42 verse 11 says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. In the midst of that period of depression, ask God to reveal his purpose in it. Stop looking inward. Stop allowing the self-pity to become a cancer. Remember this, when you're down, remember to look up. There are some steps um, that could help us uh, through a period of depression, the low tide, as I said. First, believe that God is greater than your circumstances and the problems that have you down. God is greater than either of those. And second, turn those problems over to him. Don't, don't just say words. Communicate with him. Tell him your feelings. Pray specifically, listing every, each and every area of concern. Third, uh, believe that God will use this for a purpose. You know, think and, and ask, God, what are you trying to accomplish in my life? And maybe we need to even ask, God, how am I resisting you and what your purpose is in my life? Fourth, recognize any self-pity and confess it as sin. Fifth, realize that you can't always have your own way. Your way may not be God's way. Sixth, Get your priorities in order. Put the Lord first, not yourself. Stop trying to make everything revolve around you and around your problems. You know, it's said that Christians don't have problems, they have opportunities. Opportunities to trust the, their Heavenly Father and see Him work in their lives. And seventh, Get involved with the need of someone else. Get your eyes off yourself and back into the Word of God. You cease being a missionary when you become a mission field. Jesus Christ commissioned us all to go, to go to others. Christ-centered thinking is not self-centered nor problem-centered. It sees the purpose of God in all things, the giant of depression. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for um, the examples you give in your, in your word. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that your word is honest. It reveals the 
um, the, the problems, the circumstances, people's lives that we certainly can relate to. Uh, it shows us the way that you worked and the hope that we can have in you. And I pray that uh, for any and all who, who may be going through that low tide or a period of depression and, and uh, God just reveal um, to each one um, your purpose, but even beyond uh, the steps to take that will um, bring them to that uh, uh, place of, of life, uh, full and abundant, that Jesus um, provided each of us. Uh, we pray this all in his name. Amen.